of you. Aloha. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, the East West Center. Thank you, Eric. Thank you to the Consular Corps. Uh, it's nice to be back in Hawaii, actually. Uh, and it's, it's a real privilege and honor for me to talk to the East West Center. And I think this type of exchange between the diplomatic Consular Corps and the East West Center is very important and should continue. Um, so thank you again. Uh, Eric mentioned we, we saw each other uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday. And on my way to this event, I just recall why I am here initially is we have an exhibition of an Austrian architect in Pearl Harbor. An Austrian architect who was born in Vienna three years before the First World War. So he witnessed how Europe changed from 1914 to 1918. His father had to go to the Austrian-Hungarian army. The empire collapsed later. And he had Jewish heritage and had to leave Austria, Europe, once the Nazi invaded Austria and once the Second World War started. Before that, he was married to a Russian refugee uh, and why I'm saying this is, it seems to me history is repeating itself. You mentioned that I just came from Austria. I was in May for three weeks in Austria, visiting families. And when you walk through the streets of Vienna, you see a lot of Ukrainian refugees. You see, you feel what is going on. You speak to those people. Mainly they are female with children, because the men had to stay back in Ukraine. They have to fight for their freedom, for their country, for democracy. And the hope of those Ukrainian refugees is to go back as soon as possible to the Ukraine. Uh, however, when that will be, if that will be, nobody knows. Alfred Preis, he stayed back here in the US, he designed the USS Arizona Memorial. And to him, it was so important to have a memorial for remembering those soldiers who lost their life in, in the war. So this is a circle in a way, but nowadays the world is not anymore global, it's local. So what happens in the Ukraine also has an impact here in the US. It has an impact in Europe. It has an impact on Austria. Vienna, to leave the most Western city of Ukraine, the distance is smaller than the distance from the most Southern islands of Hawaii to the most Northern island of Hawaii. So you see how, how that relates. When we talk about what happens now in the Ukraine, what happens, why Russia invaded. I think we have to go a little bit back in history. It probably started with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. And the current president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, he was a KGB agent in before the uh, Soviet Union uh, collapsed in Eastern Germany. So he was a child of the East and West division in Europe, a child of the Cold War. And then later he became president. And people now say it was always his aspiration that the Soviet Union comes again into glory. Uh, and that's a problem that we have to face in Europe, how to deal with the Soviet Union, so what was uh, the successor state of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation. So this is, this is one part. Uh, the Ukraine is the second biggest country in Europe after Russia. So it is a very, very important country. And it was also a successor state of the Soviet Union at the time. And what is important 
uh, and I come also from a legal background, in 1994, uh, the Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum together with Russia, the United States of America, the United Kingdom, giving them in the Budapest Memorandum security of those states for their territorial integrity and sovereignty. In lieu of acceding to the non-nuclear proliferation treaty, so giving away their nuclear weapons. And now it is so important to us in the West that this territorial sovereignty uh, and integrity is kept. Because what would be if an international agreement would not be acknowledged? Another important, if we go back in the history, event was the Bucharest Summit in 2008. The Bucharest Summit was uh, a NATO summit where NATO was looking into uh, enlargement. So countries that were part of the Eastern Bloc uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union aspired to enter NATO and aspire to enter the European Union. So they wanted this Western model, this Western values, and some of them already are part of the European Union. Some and many are also part of NATO, the Baltic States, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, and Ukraine, and some of the South Caucasian countries like Georgia aspired in 2008 to enter NATO. Here again, Russia and Putin was very aggressive and saying, no chance, this is a danger to our country, Russia. And as a result, he invaded or he supported an invasion into uh, Georgia, two parts of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia still are occupied by Russian troops or in support of Russian troops. And Georgia has not its full territory. Again, this now is repeated in the Ukraine. Now the Ukraine always fought between its European Union way, so its integration into the European Union and the neighborhood uh, in Russia. This culminated in 2014 where there was a protest of Euromaidan. So the values of the West uh, superseded uh, the way a closer cooperation with Russia. So the Maidan revolution actually spelled out this aspiration to become European. And then in 2014, what happened? Uh, Russia invaded or occupied, annexed, annexed the Crimea uh, Peninsula and also the eastern part of the Ukraine where there is a Russian minority, uh, Donbas. Uh, and so Donbas is Lugansk and Donetsk. So that was the start actually of what we were seeing now. Europe at the West was very clear. Whenever there is a dissolution after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we want that and we are asking the countries to stick to their international borders, to their borders, because it's so difficult to open up borders. And you see that when you look into Armenia and Azerbaijan, the conflict, you see that in, in Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, so this was a very clear formula and accepted at the time that we will stick with the borders of the then Soviet states in order to have peace and stability. But there are minorities. There are also minorities from other countries and that in itself is a root of insecurity. Therefore, Europe and the European Union wanted to integrate those countries. They said, come closer to Europe, come and share our values, because there are examples 
when integration actually at the end brought a situation where this division being in one country or the other country doesn't play a role anymore. For instance, coming back to my small country of Austria, we have a German Austrian minority in, in Tyrol, in the, in, in the north of Italy, so-called South Tyrol. And with our integration, with our accession, Austria into the European Union, this was not a problem anymore. We were in one union. There was no problem in traveling, exchanging. There was no problem in studying. So uh, ethnicity, language was just in a big Europe. So this was our aspiration. That's what we wanted uh, from those countries. But we wanted that also together with Russia. We wanted to involve Russia. I remember in those days, I was also roving ambassador for Georgia, Armenia, and Uzbekistan. And at the time, I often went to Armenia. And Armenia always wanted to come closer to the European Union. They wanted to follow what Georgia was doing. And they were asking me, whenever we come back from Brussels, after the negotiations with the European Union, Russia is asking us, what did you negotiate? What were the topics? So Ambassador, what should we tell them? And I always repeat it. We are a transparent union. There is nothing that we hide. We have our values. We have our ideas. So please do share that with Russia. We want that Russia knows what the European Union is standing for. We want them to work closer together with us and eventually also uh, to find areas where we can have a stronger cooperation, where there is freedom of movement of people, for instance. So we would be open to that. Also in the military field, uh, I recall that once the Warsaw Pact was dismantled, then NATO reached out and they formed the NATO Partnership for Peace. And there was also a NATO-Russia Council. So there was cooperation there. Uh, so we wanted Russia to be part in that process. Russia, of course, is also important. And now we are coming closer to the day when it comes to energy. Russia is an energy exporter when it comes to coal, when it comes to oil, when it comes to gas, and also when it comes to nuclear fuel rods. So those are important issues. And now when you look into the geography again, Russia is so close to Europe. So therefore there was a very, very close cooperation on the energy front. But already in 2006 and 2009, and I vividly remember 2006, where Austria held the EU presidency, Russia turned off the gas. So there was no gas in winter, early 2006, coming to Europe. So we had the sort of crisis. This repeated in 2009. And in 2014, when the European Union uh, elaborated on the first set of sanctions against Russia because of the annexation of Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, energy again was the hot potato, the big topic. So at the time, we tried to implement so-called smart sanctions. So we looked into areas where uh, it hurts Russia, but it doesn't hurt Europe. So for instance, oil exploration uh, in, in the North, for instance, in the uh, Arctic Sea. Uh, that was one part where we were looking at, but we didn't go further because we still had this wish and this hope that there is a solution, there is a diplomatic solution uh, when it comes to Ukraine. So we established diplomatic channels, we negotiated the Minsk agreement, in particular France and Germany were very active. There is this Normandy format uh, where we tried to include Russia. But there was also a part where the international community or some countries decided they want to expel Russia. That was, for instance, the G8. The G8 
in 2014 became the G7. So the largest advanced economies, it was only seven countries, including also the European Union as non-voting. And a lot of things, even when it came to sanctions, was actually done and instigated uh, by the G7. But nobody, at least in Europe, I would say, nobody thought that Putin would go that far. He went in February 24th of this year. So already last year or so, we saw that there is a military uh, building up going on at the European Council, the European uh, heads of states actually issued warnings and say, uh, we want stability. So we asked Putin and the Russian Federation to stop any military activities that could escalate the conflict in the East, in the Donbas area. But at least to Austria, but I think to a lot of Europeans, it came as a total surprise that Putin actually invaded Ukraine and not only invaded the east part of Ukraine, but apparently wanted to take over the whole of Ukraine. So he was actually going towards Kiev. He was trying to occupy Chernobyl, which was and still is a very important issue to us. Uh, because there are nuclear power stations in the Ukraine, and it's so close to Europe. Uh, so we are very, very concerned about the security of nuclear power stations. And this is one of our big, big points that there has to be security. So we were surprised. What the reasons are, we don't know. Maybe when I was thinking about that, maybe the time of COVID was a time when there was no exchange even between heads of states. So there was no direct connection talking to somebody like the Russian leader and tell him this is a no-go. Europe, the West will confront this with one voice. We stand firm. Uh, there are other uh, speculations, but we had to we had to deal with that. Now and I just wrote that down. There are maybe four areas where Europe was instrumental. Some of them, or many of them, together with our closest ally, the United States of America, because what the Ukraine grace crisis brought, in my personal perspective, is again a closer connect between Europe, the European Union, and the United States of America. Uh, one part was in the framework of the United Nations. And I want to highlight that a little bit. You know all the concept of the United Nations, you know the Security Council, because it was an attack on the sovereignty of the Ukraine. So uh, the Ukraine invoked Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations, which means uh, that was an act of aggression and they, say we have the right of self-defense uh, and that was supported by by the west by europe and the united states there was no possibility uh, to pass a security council resolution because uh, you know russia holds a veto but the security council referred the aggression of the russian federation against the ukraine to the general assembly and with an overwhelming support of 141 states voting that this is an aggression against a member of the United States, that the full sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine has to be restored. All troops have to, all Russian troops have to withdraw from the Ukraine and only five countries actually voted against this General Assembly resolution. Besides Russia, it was Belarus, it was Syria, it was North Korea, and I think it was Eritrea. So only those countries. And it also stipulates this uh, resolution that Belarus is part of that aggression. So we, we asked Belarus 
uh, to stop siding with Russia in this way of aggression. This was done in the framework of a special session, special emergency session of the General Assembly. And it was only the 11 special emergency sessions still after the inception of the United Nations uh, for this reason, the aggression of, of Russia in the Ukraine. There were two other resolutions afterwards. One was on the humanitarian situation, again, with strong support of 140. And then the suspension of Russia from the Human Rights Council, uh, where 93 countries voted in favor. So you see there is a difference. But it was a joint effort of the United States and the European Union to get this big result of countries voting clearly against the Russian Federation. The second uh, area I would like to highlight where Europe was very active, probably more than the United States, but out of different reasons, is the question of accountability and bringing uh, those people who conducted war crimes or crimes against humanity uh, in, in the Ukraine. 41 countries, including the European Union countries, actually referred the case of Ukraine to the International Criminal Court. Uh, this is legally in, interesting in, in its own way because neither Ukraine nor Russian Federation are part of the Rome Statute which established the International Criminal Court. But in November 2013, Ukraine actually filed uh, to the International Criminal Court the acceptance of the jurisdiction for whatever happens on its territory. And uh, one thing is how you see the International Criminal Court, the ICC. The other side is uh, our strong European uh, drive. There should not be any impunity. And it is a slow way, but I'm confident that at the end of the day, all those perpetrators will be indicted, they will be in front of the criminal court, including Putin and all the generals and even soldiers on the ground. Uh, and there is clear evidence that uh, crimes against humanity and probably also war crimes were committed uh, in the Ukraine. And there is a strong cooperation between the European Union and the Ukrainian uh, lawyers to get the evidence done. Now coming, I was in 15 minutes only, yeah, because we want a discussion. Now coming to what, what happens in the European Union. Uh, and I wrote four, four points, sanctions. Sanctions was one important issue. Uh, we had already sanctions back from 2014. Those sanctions were reinforced. Some additional sanctions were included. And we just are in the process of passing the sixth package of sanctions that will include sanctions against oil exports uh, from the Russian Federation. It will have a phasing out for pipeline oil, but otherwise every oil that is exported by ship from the Russian Federation will be sanctioned by the European Union. And what is our task after passing these sanctions is to get other countries, to get third countries aligned. And that's something that we will work together with the United States again, to get as many countries aligned with, with our position. Uh, then for the first time, the European Union actually sent military equipment to the Ukraine. So we acknowledge that uh, the Ukraine is defending its territory. And there was a decision by the European Union already very early to allow military equipment to be sent to the Ukraine and also to give money uh, for this military equipment. Uh, the third point is the question of enlargement. Uh, as you all know, and, and through my talk, uh, 
Ukraine aspires to become a member of the European Union. They filed in March officially their request to become such a member. And in June, the European Commission will give its first initial uh, reaction to that. And the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, already stated in April explicitly, Ukraine is part of the European family. So there is that way. And I think uh, European Union countries are open to integrate the Ukraine into, into Europe. The question is how quick that integration will take place because there are high standards. And there is a discussion amongst the European Union leaders how we should proceed, because there are other countries uh, like the countries in Western Balkans, where their actually request to join the European Union go back already 2006, 2004, or if one wants to argue, Turkey actually filed for acceding to the European Union in 1987. So, so we have to deal with that. Uh, and if there is a critical view uh, on the European Union. I also would like to say we are 27 individual states. So just imagine you would have 27 US states finding a common ground on, on issues and everyone has, every state has her own voice, her own vote on that. But what also happened is that the European wants to be militarily and from a security perspective, more autonomous. So we are looking in this strategic autonom uh, autonomous situation. So we are now elaborating on stronger security measures, on stronger defense measures. And uh, this drive to having more military power also mirrors uh, that Sweden and Finland too uh, former non-aligned countries actually filed their request for acceding to NATO. You know about the Turkish situation. We will have in the end of June a NATO summit in Madrid, and it will be interesting to see uh, how that will evolve. And today, Denmark, who is a NATO partner, but who actually opted out on the security and defense chapter of the European Union, because also the European Union has a security chapter, which is similar to Article 5, not as strong of the Atlantic Treaty, but there is also a provision that if one EU country uh, is uh, a victim of aggression, military aggression, all the other EU countries will support them. And Denmark, used to be out of this chapter. And now, due to the situation in the Ukraine and in Russia, uh, the Danish people in a referendum today, overwhelmingly, I think more than 65%, voted to enter also this security uh, chapter of the European Union. Now, thank you. Austria, and you probably also read Austria, is a neutral country. Uh, so what's the situation and the position of Austria? Uh, this neutrality is a pure military neutrality. So we are not part of a military alliance. There are no foreign soldiers on Austrian soil, uh, but it is not a political neutrality. And when there is an infringement of international law, when there is an act of aggression like in the Russian Federation, there is no room of neutrality and Austria is in full support of Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, and in full support of the decision of the European Union uh, when it comes uh, to the Ukraine. In order to have some time of discussion also, uh, I would like to conclude uh, what happens in the Ukraine is also a war on values, on our values, on democracy, uh, on a pluralistic society. And therefore, Europe stands for this model, like the United States of America stands for this model. And as you all know, it's not the majority of countries worldwide 
that stand up for this model. And therefore, this crisis, this conflict, is another clear sign that Europe, the European Union, Austria included, and the United States have to stand closer together politically, economically, and also in the security framework. Thank you so much. Thank you, Consul General Postel, for your wise words. And, and clearly, you speak from a great deal of experience. So it's uh, just an amazing and great opportunity for us. This may be a little bit of a loaded question, and I'm not sure um, if we're going down into kind of uh, dangerous territory here, but the situation is serious. The situation is not one that um, where we can mince words a lot because clearly trying the, the you know, to be nice hasn't, hasn't worked, frankly. Uh, you mentioned in your remarks that uh, European leaders have warned against Putin uh, and his military buildup in, uh, in the area surrounding Ukraine. And here we are, uh, everybody imagining or not able to imagine that an invasion would happen and it did. And so there have been uh, other kind of postulations, if you will, of uh, possibly uh, expanding beyond that even. And so in your opinion and your conversations with uh, other European leaders, uh, what are the next steps? What are the uh, actions that European countries are taking now or willing to take to, and what would it take to send a clear message that enough is enough and to stop and, and push back on the invasion that's, that's currently happening? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you're right, uh, but I think uh, Europe and the world, the Western world was united and that was something that uh, Putin did not actually uh, envision and uh, sanctions now uh, have to work. The implementation of sanctions will work, but beside that uh, di diplomacy also has, has to be uh, strong. So uh, European leaders including my own uh, Austrian prime minister, is in contact with Putin, is telling him that this is a war and it has to be stopped. Uh, so there is this way also uh, to have contacts to Putin and other, other people in Russia. But ultimately, the victim of the war is the Ukraine, the Ukrainian people. Uh, and in our view, it is upon the Ukraine to decide uh, what are the next steps. We are supporting them. So we are sending military, we as saying the, the European Union together with the United States of America, we are sending military weapons. And uh, even now they, they have some, uh, let's say, advancement to Ukraine in, in the south of Ukraine, different to the east. Uh, so maybe it will be decided on the war field uh, but my message as a diplomat is uh, war and fighting against aggression has to go in parallel with diplomatic efforts uh, and then it will be uh, president Zelensky ultimately who will tell when he wants to sit down and he probably will sit down with putin at some stage or those two at delegations to find, to find a ceasefire and to find a way out. And then again, Europe and the US will stand by the Ukraine to rebuild the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, this next question is gonna come from online and you spoke about it a little bit earlier about Austria's neutrality. So hopefully you can shed some light on this question. Will Austria join NATO or will Hungary quit? <laughs> or will Hungary quit, you mean? Uh, well, uh, when it comes to Austria, the decision of the political uh, government is clear. We will not join NATO. We understand that NATO is playing an important role, but we do understand that neutrality also has a big advantage. Austria is the third uh, headquarter of the United Nations. So we see also benefits in the neutrality. 
we think that the security and defense concept that the European Union is offering is, is also uh, important to us and we are fully integrated in that and we want to participate here. Uh, but what is also clear that uh, we have to enforce our, our army. So uh, in Austria, it's compulsory for every man to go to the military service. And we now are looking into better equipment. And uh, as you know, Switzerland, our neighbor to the West is also a neutral country. So we still think that this is the best way forward uh, for Austria. When it comes to, to Hungary, uh, in my observation, Hungary is now a difficult partner in, within the European Union. Uh, and not so much within NATO. Uh, here I see the problem more related to Turkey currently. Uh, but again, I mean, in the European Union, we are a family of 27 states. We understand, Austria also understands that Hungary has some problems and we have to find solution to that. Uh, and uh, it's our immediate neighbor and I do think that Hungary is still, when it comes to the European Union, profiting a lot from its membership to the European Union. And in my observation, after what has happened with Brexit, there is, in my view, not any other European Union country who wants to leave the European Union. It's rather other countries who want to join us. A quick, uh, quick question, uh, how, uh, how effective are the current sanctions, number one? And uh, number two is, I, we all know that some of the billionaire oligarchs' uh, value dropped. Uh, other than that, how effective it is? And uh, the, the, um, so uh, the interdependency of uh, energy, especially in Germany with Russia, is it now completely stopped or it's still going on? Or what is it on that? Thank you. Yeah. I think, I think uh, the sanctions are biting. It's the strongest package of sanctions the European Union ever has imposed on a country. Uh, it will take some time. I mean, if the oil embargo is fully implemented and by the end of the year, uh, I think 90% of what has before exported from Russia uh, to the European Union will be stopped. So, and that, that's a big, big, that will have a big, big impact on, on Russia. Uh, Germany actually decided even before the transition period to stop any oil imports from Russia. Uh, what it also will entail is that probably besides looking for diversification and looking for LNG, maybe some LNG also coming from the United States or from the Middle East, uh, it will speed up uh, a transition to green energy. So, and, and that's where Germany is, is very strong in it. So we will come away from, from fossil fuels. And eventually people are also saying that at the later stage, also gas exports uh, might be tackled by sanctions. This depends how to get, but, but in essence, I think the sanctions are hurting Russia a lot, and the real implication will be seen uh, in the months to come, and, and, and the economy of Russia will, will have severe consequences due to that sanction. Yeah. All right, our next online question, what would be the EU's response if Putin carries out his threats of using nuclear weapons in this conflict? Wow, that's, 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 that's a big and very um, important question uh, because we actually clearly stated it's a no-go and, and that would bring the whole conflict to a totally different level. Uh, so as you know, there are military, two, mil no, there is actually one uh, nuclear power in the European Union that is only France. Uh, and so 
whether or not uh, there will be uh, a retaliation. Uh, I mean, sanctions will definitely be uh, implied stronger. So that that would that would if 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 the Russian Federation would use the nuclear card, as we say, then then I think all types of sanctions will be on, will be on the table. But it is our hope. And also our understanding that it, it will not go that far. Good afternoon, uh, Council General Possible. It was nice meeting you the other day. Uh, as you know, I am close to the people in Hungary and, and Austria. Uh, but what I don't, I am also uh, very close to the people in China. And in China, um, the netizens, the people on the internet, uh, seem to have a lot more freedom or ability to contact others around the world. Uh, from your Eastern European viewpoint, why has Russia, the Russian people not been able to have uh, the freedom that the people in China have with VPNs or Radio Free Europe or what other methods of media to challenge uh, the uh, Russian government? Well, I think that the narrative of uh, Putin actually resonated with a lot of the Russian people. So, uh, and this type of disinformation is indeed also a challenge to us. So part of the sanctions are Russian media outlets because we want to tackle that disinformation. Uh, but I do think that also Russian people have access to uh, international news. Uh, the question is how far they would accept those news and how far they have the possibility also to raise their voice because it is an authoritarian regime. Uh, and. Uh, it is in basically in a state of war. Now, Consul General, if Putin is a war criminal, then why would he stop the invasion? <laughs> uh, well, one point is that, that we hope that pressure will work. And uh, you mentioned the oligarchs. So there are people who are losing a lot of their wealth. So, so that, that is one idea of why sanctioning people and taking, uh, confiscating uh, or freezing basically their, their assets is that internal pressure will start. And this internal pressure in return will try uh, to change things. And then if the military is losing out, uh, so there will pressure be again. and. When it comes to the question of war criminal, uh, I mean, one, one point is being indicted. The other is uh, being imprisoned. And there are war criminals who are indicted. They cannot move around. So supposing they, they could stay in, in Russia if there is a, a government or if he still is in power. Uh, but it, it will restrict his his possibility to move to move around definitely yeah but internal pressure i think that, that is also thank you very much um i really enjoyed your presentation my question is what is turkey's role right now because it seems to me that their geographic location and control of the dardanelles was shipping um, would have an impact? Are they standing by a boycott and sanctions against Russia? Or is their location putting them in a very precarious situation? Well, my understanding is that, that Turkey is not following the European Union sanctions. Uh, Turkey is offering herself also as a mediator. Uh, whether that is accepted by the two parties, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but there has to be a place where, at eventually, where where they meet. 
Uh, and then Turkey plays a role, but I think that was not your question, but Turkey also playing a role in the NATO enlargement uh, when it comes to Sweden uh, and Finland. Uh, and Turkey is a country that has a strategic position uh, and strategic position not only in military sense when it comes uh, from a NATO perspective, but also for, for Europe. Uh, it, it's a strategic partner, but it's a difficult partner, uh, and it needs a lot of diplomacy uh, to talk uh, to Turkey and to to actually uh, convince them about our value, our approach, uh, how to deal with the region, uh, and it's not an easy task. All right, our next online question. How credible are concerns that continued pressure on Russia could result in its further alignment with China or even India? Well, I think I think Russia always, uh, and and I mean we know before the war started, Russia uh, Putin met uh, President Xi, so there is a clear alignment between uh, Russia and and China, uh, but. Uh, I think also China is not, let's say, happy about what is going on. And uh, I mentioned this General Assembly resolution and actually China voted in favor of uh, the resolution. So it was one of the 141 countries. Uh, so, so clearly China also wants that the conflict stops. So, so that, that is, that is my, my impression. Uh, the other side is the economic implications, and and obviously, if if Russian oil is not going to the European Union, then it will go somewhere else, and that could be China, that could be India, uh, and it's it's a difficult thing, uh, and we we have to talk. Uh, to both China and India. And when it comes to India, I think the United States has, has a stronger power here. And uh, I recall uh, that after 2010, when sanctions were imposed against the Islamic Republic of Iran, there was also an oil embargo. And it also has some similarity because it was also fading out in Europe uh, and there was um, not actually people happy that, that it takes some time, but it's, it's complicated because oil has to be refined and refineries are actually uh, geared to a, a certain type of oil. Uh, but in the case of Iran, uh, Europe and the United States actually convinced the other partners, including India and China at the time, uh, to sanction Iranian oil exports. So it is possible. It, it happened in the past and it depends how united we, we can stay. Great, so I think we have time for maybe two more questions, so. Aloha, Consul Pasol, this is Dennis Ali. Um, you know, uh, apart from, I think, one or two interviews that I've seen, um, not even interviews, those were basic statements by Putin to his motivation for the invasion that were uh, lectures on, on his view on history. Um, I haven't really been able to gather uh, a clear understanding what the exit for Putin is on this whole endeavor. And I know that your um, Chancellor uh, Nehama went to uh, see Putin, and I think he was probably the last uh, international leader who actually met him in person. Do you have any insights uh, further than uh, or beyond this point of, of uh, a history perspective, why he is doing this and what the end game might possibly be for Russia? Well, I, I, think, I think there was a, a misjudgment, a clear misjudgment by Putin and he thought that uh, invading and annexing Ukraine would be an easy, easy task. So, uh, and probably he was also misled by, by his military people. 
And that happens when you are living in, in a sort of bubble. You always see that if you have a head of state who is not democratic elected and stays on for almost 20 years now, so they are living sometimes in a different reality. So he was not expecting uh, this, this way. And to our chancellor, uh, Nehama, prime minister, he first went to Ukraine and he saw uh, where war crimes were committed. And he was so shocked uh, that he took the view one has to tell what happens there also face to face to Putin. Because our fear, and that actually ties in what I have said, is that he's not correctly informed. Uh, and this was his intention to sit down and tell Putin, look, three days ago, I was in Bucha. I saw what happened. I saw what your soldiers did. And that's the reality. You have to stop that war. And also to tell him, be clear, there is a unity in the European Union. There is a unity that if this war doesn't stop, we will continue with sanctions and they will, they will hurt you. They will hurt you even more. So, so that was the message he wanted to convey. And it seems to me that in the last couple of weeks also, the Chancellor of Germany and the President of France at least called Putin and talked to him over the phone also to convey that message because our idea is we still have to keep the contacts and, and that is maybe also connected what uh, one of the previous questions was when it comes to the nuclear. Uh, so. I think it's important to talk to him uh, and to give him also uh, this impression they are still talking to me and they are telling me there is a limit. So be careful uh, to, to present him with the reality and not what he might hear from his people. We have time for one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, I'm, I'm free. I, okay. I, 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 I... All right, last question. How is Austria and other border countries coping with the Ukrainian refugees? What's the reaction of the general citizenry for these border countries to this influx? Yeah, no, I think I think the border countries are very very brave and courageous. Uh, Austria is a Austria is a rich country, so for Austria it's it's not a problem uh, to to support them, to give them social security, health insurance. They even are allowed to enter immediately the workforce. Uh, so, so they are integrated. Uh, other countries like Moldav Moldavia, uh, Romania, even Poland, they are, they are not so rich countries. So for them, like Moldavia, it's, it's a burden. And, and we also, as European Union and as Austria, we are supporting uh, Moldavia in, in helping the Ukrainian people. Uh, what I experienced and talking to Ukrainian refugees in, when I was in May there. Uh, and what will be interesting to see is what happened if the war goes on and estimates are that it will go on for months and months. So those refugees are more and more integrated. Uh, the children, are going to school, they are learning German or other languages, uh, and uh, it will be more and more difficult for them to going back. Uh, but eventually it's important to reconstruct and rebuild their country. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's in my view, understandable. If, if you live in a country like Austria and your children get integrated uh, and you aspire for a better life, that that one or the other refugees will, will stay. Uh, we, have, we, have seven millions, we have 7 million Ukrainians who, who left Ukraine as refugees, and we have 8 million who are internally displaced. Uh, so it's, it's 15 million of, of people who lost their, their house. 
uh, and, and that's a big, big number. All right, we're going to thank you so much, Consul General Michael Fussell. We um, are extremely privileged and honored to have someone of your caliber and experience here in Hawaii. It's, it's truly a remarkable and unique experience for us to, uh, to have firsthand uh, observations and, and thoughts from somebody who's um, so experienced and, and so connected to the international diplomatic scene and, and diplomacy uh, in general. So um, just wanted to thank you so much for your remarks.